My name is Ismail Royer. I am the uh, director of the Islam and Religious Freedom Action Team at the Religious Freedom Institute. At the Religious Freedom Institute, our goal is to uh, secure religious freedom for everyone, everywhere. And one of the uh, amazing things about uh, the United States is its commitment to religious liberty. It's the first amendment to the Constitution and the, 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 the primary uh, freedom that America is founded on. And yet it's an ideal. Religious liberty is an ideal that um, is never and can never be fully realized. And the reason it can never be fully realized is because human beings are imperfect. They are not perfectible. And so we always, uh, we, have this, um, we have this ideal as something to, to strive for and to reach for, um, but it's something that uh, is always a work in progress. And so in understanding um, the history of how America has tried to come ever closer to that uh, ideal of religious freedom, it's very important to study the history and the current situation of religious minorities because it's through the resilience of the religious minorities in America that America has uh, been blessed to, uh, uh, to come closer to its ideal. Because it's one thing to, be, to say that we believe in, believe in religious freedom for the majority, but it's another thing to say that we believe in religious freedom for unpopular or um, uh, un strange, unfamiliar religious minorities. And although ma it, many people may not realize it, uh, we have uh, a very, very strong um, uh, uh, history of, re of resilience among the religious minorities, including the Catholic uh, faith, including the Mormon faith, and including Muslims. And the history of each one of these groups in America is, is not well known, the history of the oppression of these groups. But um, among the most amazing is the history of the Muslim uh, experience in America, particularly the um, very early history and the history of um, this, uh, many of the slaves who came over who were Muslims, and then succeeding early waves of Im immigrants. And we're going to hear a really fascinating uh, history of that from our brother Amir Muhammad. And in fact, Amir Mohammed is the director of this museum uh, that we're in here, to, that we're in today, uh, America's Islamic Heritage Museum. Uh, I will introduce Amir by saying that I have, and the museum, by saying that I've known Amir since 1996. I, uh, he is a very, very close uh, uh, brother to me. I look at him as my one of my mentors and, and one of my uncles. Um, and I, I've been very blessed to, to know him in my life. When I first met him, when I was about 21, uh, he would um, he would come in and he would show me here. Here are some artifacts that I found on my on my travels in uh, you know through uh, through the South or through the Midwest. Here are some uh, some gravestones of Muslims and so on. And it was all very fascinating. And uh, lo and behold, he turned that early research that he was doing into a museum. And God willing, this museum will um, continue to grow and uh, stand as a uh, as a uh, as a landmark uh, to preserve that history of er, um, of Muslims of Muslims in America. And we're going to hear all about that and how it was for early uh, early Muslims slaves and early uh, uh, immigrants and uh, emancipated slaves uh, and how it was for them to practice their religion and then we're going to hear from uh, well and actually let me let me take that opportunity to give you a more uh, formal uh, background of Amir Amir, is an, uh, Amir Muhammad is an accomplished and noted researcher, historian, author, and poet whose works have gained him international rec uh, recognition. Mr. Muhammad is the president, co-founder, and curator of America's Islamic Heritage Museum, a division of Collections and Stories of American Muslims Incorporated established in 1996. He's among the most foremost historians and researchers of the Islamic experience in the United States, as well as one of the leading activists in creating public awareness of America's rich Islamic history. He's an author of eight books, including Muslims in America, Seven Centuries of History, um, America's uh, Masajid and Islamic Center as a Pictorial Account, Muslim Veterans of American Wars, and Unique Tombstones Found Across the United States. He has lectured and exhibited at Harvard University, Stanford University, Rutgers University, Howard University, University of Pittsburgh, and so on. So, and then we're blessed to hear from Katrina Sanders. Katrina Sanders is 
um, really an extraordinary uh, phenomenon. Uh, I'm, I'm, I actually, in researching um, who we would bring to speak at this event, um, uh, it, was a, it was a great uh, find to, to discover her. And in fact, just reading her biography and, and about her work uh, enlightened me to many, many things that I didn't know about at all. And so I'm really uh, grateful that we're going to be able to hear from her today. She is a, an associate professor at the University of Iowa in the Department of Educational Policy policy and leadership studies. And her research interests are situated within African American education, Catholic education, and American race relations. She's the author of Intelligent and Effective Direction, the Fisk University Race Relations Institute, 1944-1969, and the Struggle for Civil Rights, and is currently working on her second book, The Rise and Fall of Black Catholic Education in a Changing South, 1866-1976, under contract with New York University Press. Uh, Professor Sanders' work on black Catholic education and history have appeared in the edited, work, edited works Uncommon Faithfulness, The Black Catholic Experience, and she has also served as consulting editor and author for um, the of, uh, Adam Matthew Digitization Project, American Race Relations, Introduction to Race in America, which I actually I tried to get access to and wouldn't uh, let me in because I didn't have the password, but it looked really fascinating. So maybe you can tell, tell us how to, how to do that later, but it looks like it's a fascinating uh, database of um, race relations um, in America. And so we're going to hear not only about the history of Catholic persecution in the United States from Professor Sanders, but also the experience of African American uh, Catholics and their own uh, struggle within the Catholic Church. And then we're going to hear from uh, Kathleen Flake. Uh, Professor Flake's research in the history of American religious history focuses on the adaptive strategies of 19th and 20th century American religious communities and the effect of pluralism on religious identity. She's also interested in the constructive function of text and ritual in maintaining and adapting the identity and gendered power structures of religious communities. In the area of American legal history, she studies the influence of American law on American religion and the theological tensions inherent in the First Amendment religious clauses. That's, that's really interesting. I don't know if you'll have a chance to get into that, but that, uh, that's, that's something that I'm very interested in. In the area of American legal history, she studies the influence, oh, excuse me. Uh, her current project is Mormon Matriarchy, a study of gendered power in antebellum America. So what we're going to hear uh, from uh, Professor Flake is the history of Mormon persecution in the United States. And I was uh, blessed to have gone on a um, on a tour of um, the Mormon, um, uh, of the, uh, essentially the historical um, trail of Mormon persecution. Uh, I went to Nauvoo, um, Illinois, uh, to, to see the original um, location of the, the first Mormon temple and the, uh, um, the jail in Carthage, Illinois, where uh, Joseph Smith, who was considered a prophet by the uh, uh, Church of Latter-day Saints, uh, was killed by a mob. And so um, we're going to hear from each one of these fascinating speakers about the history of the persecution of their communities. And we're going to hear from, in the end, Imam Talib uh, Rashid, uh, who is the Imam of uh, America's mosque, Masjid Muhammad, um, a critical, very important uh, mosque in the United States and here in Washington, DC, and a, uh, and a great historical um, uh, place in its own right about the resilience of American of American religious minorities. So, let, bef without any further ado, let's uh, hear from our brother Amir Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. With the name of God, the Most Gracious, the Most Merciful. I'd like to welcome everyone. I'd like to thank Ishmael Islamic Freedom Institute for inviting us and sharing, allowing us to share the history of Muslims in America. The history of Muslims in America really began as they came here as explorers. In 1312, Abu Bakr, um, Mansa Musa's brother, they traveled over here and you find different records of their um, presence going through um, Mississippi, Natchez River, through the Mississippi River, and Natchez, and throughout Panama and Cuba. But I wanna talk about the Muslims that came here through persecution. It really began, if you look at the Spanish Inquisition, Muslims fled here. They came here because they was persecuted, and you find their records in their presence. You hear um, Estevanico, he's credited with discovering Arizona and New Mexico. Then you have the Muslims that came through in, in South Carolina that were uh, through the uh, Spanish Inquisition, the first Muslim political activity that was ever done was in 1753. It was two Muslims, one named Adele Connor and the other one was Mahmoud Muhammad. They petitioned the government for their freedom. It was written all in Arabic and it was a Jewish woman 
that broke down the translation of that. So that was one of the first intersection of faith, helping one another. Um, you'll find that document over there. Um, that was known as Moors. The law of the land in the United States stated that if you was a Moor or a Turk, you got the right to be free. You can't own slaves, but you got the right to be free. So this group of Muslims petitioned for their freedom. You'll find another record of Muslims coming here um, through the African diaspora. The first known many of y'all seen that movie Black Panther. When Black Panther, one of the ter um, names that they used, they used Dijalo. It was one of the popular names, Dijalo. Um, and another term they used was Fulani. Fulani was one of the first Muslim hafiz, a Muslim scholar, one that knew the Quran. His name was Job Ibn Dijalo. He arrived here through Annapolis, Maryland. And he was able to get his freedom because he went to a church and they found him praying. And then they found he could write, he had intelligence, he had faith, and there's articles about him. And he wound up going to England where he wrote down the Quran three times for memory. Then the next phase that you find a group of Muslims that are coming here, we know the story of Kunta Kinte, um, but a lot of us don't realize he was a Muslim. Um, his son, there's a, a picture of his son, Chicken George. Um, he's dressed in an Islamic throne or Islamic garb. There's, um, there's a very rich, long history of Muslims' presence in the United States. There's three like, type of Muslim personalities that you'll find appearing. You either find them as scholars, you'll find them as entrepreneurs, or you'll find them as leaders. Uh, one of the uh, leaders, two of the leaders, most popular leaders in the United States uh, as Muslims in the war, uh, war of 1812, one of his name was Bilali Muhammad, and the other one was Sali Bilali. Many of us know, or we heard the terminology called the Gullah people. Those Gullah people, the Geechee people, they're known as those Gadala people, those people that believe in Allah. And you'll find there's reports of them praying, fasting, dickering. Even in Washington, D.C., one of the first earliest known Muslim personalities in the United States or in Washington, D.C. area, his name was Jarl Mahmoud. And he was known for praying, fasting, using his dicker beats. He lived in Georgetown. Matter of fact, the building that we are housed in today is a, a unique um, piece. Where that his uh, slave owners, the people that owned them, was the Bill family. Um, the descendants of the Bill family had owned this building. They first built it as a carriage house, and they had it in many different other phases. And earlier on, it was even a Jewish bakery. Um, with that family, they freed Yarrow Mahmoud. In 1973, Masjid Muhammad, which was known as Muhammad's Holy Temple, Temple Number no. 4 at the time, they purchased that building. So the Muslims had been in this building for 50 years. As Yarrow Mahmoud was free from the Bill family, the Muslims were able to purchase a building in Washington, D.C. and hold this building that we're here today in an interfaith concept, in an interfaith spirit based on that family and their uh, relationship with the Muslims. Another uh, intersection that you find with Muslims, matter of fact, the law of the United States in 1685 stated that if you was a Moor or a Turk and you got a relationship with the, your country got a relationship with the King of England, you got the right to be free. You can't own slaves, but you got the right to be free. So you find Muslims' early presence here in the United States. You find um, Muslims, there's a town called Muhammad, Illinois, there's a town called Muhammad, Texas, Mecca, Indiana. You'll find tombstones written in Arabic. People that come from now the Ottoman Empire, you'll find tombstones all throughout the United States with the one finger on it. We found them from Florida, tip of, tip of Florida, all the way up to Canada, as far as west as Kansas. That, and when, when you'll see, if you look it up and you Google, the, the historians say that they believe it pointed up to um, God or the oneness of God. But we know as Muslims, Muslims use this symbol, as a, for, symbol for the oneness of God. There's a story, unique story, over um, 1,400 years ago, one of the first Muwetans, you know, the, when the Muslim called the prayer, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, was inspired by this man named Bilal Ibn Rabah. He was the first um, Muwetan. He was also... Um, the wazir, the first um, accountant for the Muslim community back that time. And Bilal, he was tortured, he was persecuted when he converted to al-Islam. His slave owner put a rock on his chest and all he could say was a hot, a hot, a hot. He couldn't do that no more, he put up the one finger. Well, in America, first Muslim community leaders, we found Bilali Muhammad, Sali Bilali, and in between those two Bilals, we found this tombstone with the one finger on it. And that tombstone name was Sambo. And you know, in America, we used to make mock of that Sambo, Sambo, where you been? Um, but that Sambo, many West Africans named their second son Samba. 
means the warrior spirit. If you got children, that second child always want to compete with the oldest and dominate the younger. And this is where they find in America hundreds of people with that name Samba. Sambo, Samba, it's all the same, either uh, it the fir as the first name or the last name. So Muslims in America have a very rich, rich, long history. We fought in all American wars, from the Revolutionary War, World War XII, to the current wars. We've um, helped build the steel mills, the car factories. We've, um, we're not cowboys, we're camel boys. United States used 75 camels to go out west. You know, I used to watch cowboys and Indian pictures. There's an old cowboy picture that called the, South, the Southwestern Trail. And it shows three actors dressed like Arabs, praying, getting up, taking camels. And one of them, they call them High ha Jolly. But we know them as High Jolly. And the woman back in the 1900s, you'll find uh, his tomb. He was buried in Quartz, Arizona. There's a tombstone that they built for him in, with a pyramid and a camel on top of it. And the other one, August Muhammad, was the one that established the town of Muhammad, Illinois, um, Texas. Had a post office from 1857 to 1913, if I'm right. Yes, 1913, they had a post office. So we've been part of the American fabric, somewhat hidden, somewhat persecuted. But in the last, since 1975, the Muslims, um, kept themselves prior to that isolated, would engage in American society, would not vote, would not participate. But under the leadership of Mom Worthy Muhammad, who was the son of our own Elijah Muhammad, engaged us, told us that we are part of the American family. We've been here, participate, get involved, engage. Matter of fact, he was one of uh, the first interfaith leader of the 20th century was Imam Worthy Muhammad. He engaged us to go and involved. Matter of fact, he was one of the first imams to go have an audience with the Pope. And the Imam Worthy Muhammad said that we're one humanity, we're one people, to move away from the colors and to come into the oneness of God, then come to the oneness of understanding that we're all humans. He put more emphasis on what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, may God's mercy and peace be upon him. He said he, Prophet Muhammad was a, uh, a prophet for humanity, he wasn't a prophet for Arabs, uh, Africans or Muslims, but he was a prophet for humanity. And he, he showed the linkage from Abraham to Muhammad that we're all one, one humanity. And this is what the call God is calling us to, to come to oneness of him. Um, and it, it, the Quran also encourages us how to compete, to compete in righteousness, to compete in goodness. You know, he says that it uh, uh, righteousness is not turning to the east or to the west, but in our good deeds and your good actions and your kindness. And this is what we have to come to. Our society today, many of us was persecuted, the Mormons, the, the Jews, the Catholics, many people. You know, if we, um, the concept they call uh, naturalism, naturism, that, you know, if you wasn't part of their group or you, they saw you something separate, they kept us isolated. But our society is merging together, bringing us together as one humanity, one people. In America, we say that America is one of the greatest countries that exists today. In America, we are the leaders throughout the world. They say a superpower. But what, can, what should we represent to the world? How can we call the world back to humanity? By showing us that we're one humanity. We, a lot, God says that he made us not tribes and nations um, despise one another, but to get to know one another. We see the diversity in society. We see the diversity in the trees. We see the diversity when it comes fall. We see all the different colors of the leaves and we marvel at this beauty. We see the colors of in spring and we marvel at the difference of the beauty. But when it comes to the human family, we want to isolate, segregate, and oppress. Well, we need to learn to look at the beauty of our diversity and understand and learn from one another because it's, it's a, a great learning. Um, and I feel that I'm blessed because I was a Christian, raised as a Christian, uh, a very good Christian. Um, I, I'm going to act like one, but I was raised as one. Uh, <laughs> my mother was, uh, was very, very, you know, you hear that, the terminology, silence is golden. You know, my mother was very silent in her words. You know, and never heard no cuss words. Um, matter of fact, when I grew up, there was a record called Funky Funky Broadway. And we couldn't play that in our house just because the word funky. You know, I had to, and it still bothers me today. You know, 
saying that word, I'm not comfortable. There was manners and principles. You know, she taught us in our house, she taught us that God was one. Man, when I came a Muslim, she said in her father's house, there's many mansions. There's diversity. And we read this in the Bible, there's diversity. God, you know, he didn't make us one. There's, his house is there for all of us. If we do good deeds, good actions. So Muslims in America, we have a very rich and long history. And a lot of us came here through persecution. I tell some of the um, stories. Um, matter of fact, um, one of the stories was uh, Joseph. Yusuf, we know him in the Quran, Yusuf as Yusuf. And um, by reading the Quran, been reading the Quran for over 40 some odd years. And maybe about 10 years ago, I had re heard Reverend Jesse Jackson s speak on the story about Yusuf, Joseph, and his story. I said, wow, that's the same story that I hear in the Quran. Then I was at a um, program and heard this rabbi speak about the story of David and his story. I said, wow, that's the same as our story. So if we get to know one another and share one another's stories, we see that same message is there, how to become a better human being, how to become a better servant to serve God, who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. I thank you all for your time. Thank you all for allowing us to share a little bit of our experience. And please, afterwards, come throughout the museum and learn, and I'll answer any questions. May God increase our faith, increase our love, increase our consciousness, and our willingness to work together as one humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Amir. That, is, that was very beautiful. And uh, uh, the, next, we're going to hear uh, from Dr. Katrina Sanders, who's going to provide a brief history of Catholic oppression in America based on her research of African American Catholics. OK, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> and so I'm not going to. Uh, you know how they tell you to stay in your comfort zone? Do you? Um, so I'm going to do me uh, kind of a blend of that scholarly voice, um, but also hoping uh, that um, the information is something that is usable. And so um, it wasn't until the 2016 uh, New York Times article on Georgetown University uh, selling 272 slaves to keep the university going, that a lot of people in the country realized that there were black Catholics or that there was some type of connections between blacks and the Catholic Church, um, which was very interesting to me because a year before in 2015, Pro Pope Francis visited the United States. And I uh, tell my classes that I looked at most of the media, social media, media um, platforms that I could find, radio, television, um, to see if there was really any mention or any images of black Catholics in the United States, and I really didn't see anything. Um, I did get one communication from um, uh, some other researchers who knew of my interest, and they let me know where I could find some of those pieces. But if you're familiar or if you're not familiar, in 1991, Father Cyprian Davis wrote a history of black Catholics in the United States. And Father Cyprian Davis clearly situates that there is a history of black Catholics in these United States. Uh, to, we were asked tonight to discuss the ways in which the ideals of religious freedoms have been imperfectly implemented. And, as I was thinking about the topic, uh, I w was thinking that this is a season where there are lots of graduations that are going on around the country. And I just flew in this morning after hooding one of my PhD students. And one of the things that um, we have a lot of conversation conversations around these days are having the students be able to give three minute elevator pitches about what their research is about so that people can kind of concisely get it. And so in thinking of that, in that vein, I uh, thought about three things that I thought would be um, worthy of sharing and worthy of having you think about when it comes to Catholicism, and then in particular, black Catholics in the United States. Um, so when we think of the Catholic Church in the United States, I think it's really important for us to, um, to remember that 
uh, for the most part, the Catholic Church is a church of immigrants or was a church of immigrants. And although we have on record um, a Catholic signing the Declaration of Independence, um, and this Catholic actually ended up being the uncle of uh, the first Catholic bishop in the United States, that was a point in time where Catholics were not really feared. We did not have that tipping point of Catholics in the United States. But when we start getting the massive amounts of Europeans coming into the United States from the wrong part of Europe, the wrong, I'm not saying it was wrong, but the thought was that it was wrong from Southern and Eastern Europe, then the whole idea of Catholicism became something that people feared. And I think if you look at it today and you, you look at the nice prestigious universities and schools, we tend to forget that, again, it's a population um, that has um, suffered persecution. Um, if you remember your history about the Whigs in the United States, people who um, really supported nativism in the United States, Catholics were viewed as the enemy. And one of the things that I found um, in my research, um, I have a diary of a priest who toured around the South, and it's very interesting to see the priest talk about the times when um, he was threatened to be lynched because he was Catholic, and he was told to get out of the area. So I think, again, it's very important, although we see prestigious universities, we see elite Catholic schools, uh, that we remember that the population was a population that was initially persecuted. And uh, my students always ask what happened, and I said, well, there's this great uh, book, one of many, how the Irish became white. And when you read those books, you, you see what that collective does as far as power in the United States. Um, one of the second things um, that I want to talk about actually leads back into black Catholics. Again, when we think about uh, the Catholic faith, Catholics coming into the United States being persecuted, one of the, the things that they found that they needed to do, that they wanted to do, was to establish their own school systems. And the reason they established those school systems was because during the 1850s, when we were, um, when the United States was beginning to um, require uh, education, kids have to go to school, uh, Catholics found that the information, uh, the course material that was being taught was anti-Catholic. And so the idea was why are we paying taxes to send our kids to school to learn to hate ourselves? And so it became this big push um, through a number of Catholic councils uh, uh, meetings to say we are going to set up a school system for our children so that our children will learn about their faith but that they're also educated. And so we see that happening. Um, if we go back and think about black Catholics in these United States, we see that, again, there was definitely um, enslavement of, of, of blacks, uh, Catholic clergy, Catholic religious selling uh, black bodies, um, um, some actually um, being very supportive in public, um, saying that it was you know a, a good that was necessary, um, put, placing it within the economy. Um, but when we also look at it, we see that in the records, um, Catholics are saying that they are very fearful of being, especially in the South, of being in a place where they're demonized and not wanting to take the risk to go out and help another group. And so we do have that on record. So these histories um, all, I would say they do blend together because we see fear, we see persecution, we see people not acting um, when they know that they should act because of you know fear of, of repercussions on themselves. Um, one of the other things, um, the third thing in talking about black Catholics in the United States 
It's understanding that throughout the persecution, there has been agency and self-determination. And so the persecution um, basically does derive from enslavement and the church not recognizing Catholics, black Catholics, um, and actually wanting to do something or doing something uh, to, for black Catholics um, until after emancipation. And so with the Third Plenary Council in 1866, the church already had on record that it would do um, provide churches for, uh, for blacks, but we see um, that money starts filtering through with the other councils. And so we see that there is a system put in place with uh, teachers that will be there, uh, funding agencies that will help the schools. And so we see all of those things develop. But we see also within that agency um, the rise of, um, just drew a blank, Daniel Rudd. Um, and the Afro, uh, um, the Afro Catholic Congress. We also see the Afro American Congress. We also see then the development of uh, Thomas Wyatt Turner, uh, who was a professor at Howard University, organizing the Federated Colored Catholics. We see the Black Catholic Congress that takes off in 1968, and this was a coalition of priests who, after the assassination of, of Dr. King. Um, they were. They already had a meeting planned, but they decided to get together a couple of days earlier, before all of the priests got together. So, um, in one of an, an article that I did, I uh, named the part of the article. The title is uh, "Stealing a Meeting," because in the the tradition of the enslaved, um, you know, the enslaved would often have to go off in secret to have a meeting to talk about things that they needed to talk about. And so this was a meeting of black Catholic priests who were seeing their cities you know, tearing up, being burned down, police shooting people. And so they called a meeting and they said that they had to talk. And one of the things that came out of that meeting is a statement, just the first line um, that I will read to you, dated April 18, 1868 where the priest went on record saying, the Catholic Church in the United States is primarily a white, racist institution, has addressed itself primarily to white society, and is definitely a part of that society. And so we see then the Black Catholic Sisters forming. We see another, I mean, a number of laity programs, uh, I'm sorry, laity organizations forming. And so you see black Catholics again uh, picking up the tradition of understanding that yes, they are truly Catholic, truly black, authentically Catholic and black. I just saw my, two, my, my warning, so I'm going to sit down. That was obviously just the tip of the iceberg, so hopefully we can explore more of that in the question and answer period. Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Sanders. And now we're going to hear from uh, uh, Professor uh, Kathleen uh, Flake to discuss the history of Mormon persecution in America. Thank you. I am delighted to be here. I appreciate the work of the Religious Freedom Institute. I think it's, it's a force for good, and I'm glad to be invited to participate with you. I'm also delighted to be at the Islamic Heritage Museum, the American Islamic Heritage Museum. I teach Nation of Islam at the University of Virginia. I am by no means an expert, so I'm glad to learn from an expert tonight. But I am thrilled to be in this museum as I walk about it. I not only see the power of this history, but I see the love of these people. And, I, and, I, and it communicates itself to me. So I'm really, I'm just delighted to be here in ways I didn't expect to be. I knew I'd like you, but I didn't. Uh, no, it feel this good to be here, so thank you. I'm going to do what I do quickly because I'm the kind of person that likes to answer questions more than to talk at people. But there's three things I'd like to do tonight. I'd like to honor uh, the invitation I received and talk about the persecution that was wrecked upon the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for a couple of hundred years now. Um, and identify that by type and a little bit by cause. But I think the other half of the invitation matters as well, which is what is the promise? You know, how, 
I, I think the Latter-day Saints not only illustrate the kinds of persecution that can exist in a religiously disestablished nation, but they also can be a model for how to cope with that. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't presume to generalize from those to any of your other groups, but you might find an idea in there that would be useful to you. Uh, this, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is now 16 million members worldwide, notwithstanding efforts to the contrary. So let's go through some of those efforts. Uh, the church was organized in 1830 in the midst of American revivalism and in the midst of America trying to figure out where authority lay. And that was one of the reasons there was great persecution against the Latter-day Saints, because they had an additional Bible. Joseph Smith produced the Book of Mormon as a companion to the Bible. And in a nation that had rejected all other kinds of authority and was raising the power of individualism and democracy, there was a lot of anxiety about that. And here comes another source of authority. So almost from the very beginning in 1820, in fact, indeed, the very beginning in 1820, there's the kind of popular resistance, the destroying of baptism ceremonies, just ruffian kind of uh, problems and, and just persecution of members, uh, isolating them, uh, forms that you would see now being expressed against uh, Muslims in this country. Uh, some of it commercial activity, but a lot of it just personal and voluntary. The Latter-day Saint story is one of increasingly moving westward. They kind of voted with their feet, as is always possible in America, at least it was, this sense of space and, the, and what seemed like unoccupied, though it was fully occupied territory to their west. So they moved next, next to the Ohio, and you see persecution following there. One of the distinctive features of the Latter-day Saints was they always gathered people to a central location, where you see others like the Methodists riding circuits and planting branches or classes, they would call them in different places, and they would grow them in those places. Latter-day Saints would fan missionaries out across the United States and Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, the uh, missionaries were in India as early as 1830. It makes you almost think, who did they think they were at this point? There were so few of them. But anyway, they, um, they were uh, very uh, convinced of the truth which they possessed and extended their message around uh, not just their near locale, but far, uh, far locales, and, and gathered people to a central place. And that caused another kind of problem, a political problem, because even if they weren't a majority in the county where they lived, they were a plurality. That means they could always nudge the vote in one direction or the other. And so that caused another layer of anxiety. And so in Ohio, near the Finger Lakes area, you see violence breaking out with, with greater fierceness. Joseph Smith himself one night is hauled from his, his bed and tarred and feathered, and they try to castrate him and pour poison down his throat. Uh, he survives it, survives it to preach uh, uh, peace the next day, but in the course of it, one of his children dies from exposure, who is ill. There were uh, mobbings, there were just a lot of problems in Kirtland, Ohio. Uh, contemporaneous with the Kirtland community, the Latter-day Saints tried to build what they believed was their Zion in Missouri. And in Missouri, again, immediately violence broke out against them. Some of it was, again, this aggregation of a population, but it was also there were class differences and race differences there. The Latter-day Saints would not allow people to join their church if they were slaveholders. And so Missouri being the kind of state it was politically at that time, pre to the Civil War, that caused a lot of violence against Latter-day Saints because they were gathered together one, in one place and supported one another and had a communal economy, their farms prospered. And so people wanted their land. And so you have a seven-year Mormon war that goes on in Missouri with outbreaks of violence. It peaks in 1838 with an extermination order by the, the state governor. And at that point, you see that shift from a kind of what, what the saints would call a mobocracy, a reign of mobs that would terrorize them. They then saw state action, which uh, was lawful under the Constitution before the application of the 14th Amendment applied the First Amendment to the states. Um, they uh, had state action. And I just wanted to read you one little peek into, into the narrative. When we speak in these generalizations, of course, we are covering individuals that um, have, have extraordinary stories, stories that you see in this museum. Um, uh, Philinda Myrick wrote later, the mob came upon us in the after part of the day with Mr. McComstock at their head. She recognized him. He was a neighbor from the local community. These were neighbors doing this to them. 
Uh, Mr. Comstock at their head and commenced firing on helpless men and women and children, and there were 15 killed and was buried in one hole the next day. Among these was my husband, Levi N. Myrick, instantly killed, and also a child of mine, mortally wounded, who died about four weeks after. So there were rapes and, and murders and uh, whippings and burning of farms throughout the Missouri experience. The saints flee in the dead of winter. They go to Illinois, but again, they're evicted from Illinois, and they decide to leave the United States. It's probably one of the first immigrations as in out of the United States for the purposes of religious liberty. And they, they cross the plains, again, its own hardship. They settle what they think is a territory that nobody else wants. But very quickly, the United States wins the war against Mexico, and they're right back in the United States. And you have a kind of southern reconstruction in the Intermountain West with federal officers. And, uh, and one particularly dramatic point in 1857, the United States Army is sent against Utah. And so they occupy the territory. The Civil War starts, so they bring the California volunteers to occupy Utah. So increasing state actions. One of the reasons the Latter-day Saints were not liked, of course, is they, they had a hierarchical authority. They believed in revelatory authority. And they also believed in a, in a countercultural marriage system that they called plural marriage. Uh, and uh, ex post facto laws were were. Uh, promulgated against it, and there began a 50-year period of civil disobedience by the saints and raids by federal marshal and all kinds of attempts to change the Latter-day Saint belief practice. That's a whole other discussion. I, as they say, I wrote a book about it. I'll only say that it's eventually, si it's eventually solved by political negotiation through a four-year trial before the Senate Committee on Privileges and Election over the election of a, of a Mormon apostle, a Latter-day Saint apostle, to the United States Senate. But it teaches us something. You cannot force religious people to change. You tell a Baptist they cannot baptize, they'll dig a hole in their basement. Political negotiation, negotiation, knowing one another, understanding what's at our core and what's at our periphery, that really matters. So what can we learn from the Latter-day Saints? I just want to leave you with, with three thoughts in my final, what I think is two minutes. Um, what I, as a scholar, as I look at how they've managed this situation, I've seen them do, do I have five minutes? All right, okay, I'll take my five. Um, I'll, I'll take my five minutes. Um, obviously, there was a stalemate between the Latter-day Saints in Utah and, and uh, national law. Oh, I need to tell you this too. In these years of, of all kinds of discrimination, a pejorative term for the Latter-day Saints was American Islam. They used to call it American Islam. Why do you think that was? Well, they had a sacred book in addition to the Bible. They had a sacred book. They um, believed in revelation and holiness. They were a sacramental, what we would call in Christianity, a sacramental tradition with rites, right, and worship. All of this was very foreign to Protestantism. And of course, they practiced polygamy, right? So it was American Islam, and that was a majority, but we... we and they, yes, and they didn't drink alcohol. I'm sure we can think of many more. But of course, we claim that as a way in which we can find full fellowship with, with you and, and don't, don't consider that an insult at all. But anyway, so how did they survive the army, criminalization, disincorporation so they had no legal identity, the jailing of over a thousand of their members in, in various US penitentiaries over the practice of polygamy? And even today, you can see it's not persecution. Right, really. It's just a kind of steady level of insult and anxiety about Mormonism in the culture, right? Though, around my first point, you have seen some renewed persecution. The first thing I want to say is I believe we have to be present, we have to be visible, we have to not, we have to show our best, right? We have to participate in the American system of government. And even though you'll be excluded in your efforts, you'll be frustrated, you have to network, you have to continue to exercise your rights as American citizens. And gradually, I think the message of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is, in the words of another very important campaign, it gets better. Remember, it gets better. There are fundamental principles and values and good people in this country that when you show up, 
and you show yourself to be active participants working for the common good, when you show your best and don't let yourself be defined by your worst, it will change. In the words of one of our leaders, Sharon Eubank, the good that religion can do, especially when it comes to sustainable development goals, is amplified if religious groups work in partnership with each other and with governments and non-governmental actors. Secondly, be good, be generous, be patient, understand why people fear us, understand their interests. I've tried to name some of them tonight for you about, I, I, I think there weren't reasons to have those fears, but I could understand in a newly insecure government that was the early United States, the Latter-day Saints with their their strong identity, their strong political core, and their other differences. It was a very fraught situation. Again, I think if they talked more and mobbed less, it would have been better. But be good, be generous, be patient, be good neighbors, and it gets better. Also, I mentioned this a moment ago. Know what matters. Know what's willing to stand your ground on and know what doesn't matter. For example, the Book of Mormon musical. Insulting. I believe, actually, it's more racist than it is anti-Mormon. However, what people noticed, which itself is an interesting thing to look at, um, what they've enjoyed laughing about uh, is, is Mormonism. And the leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had then a decision to make about how to handle that. And I don't know if you know how they handled it, but it was brilliant. Um, they, in every playbill, in New York, they put a little message in that said, this production may attempt to entertain audiences for an evening, but the Book of Mormon as a volume of scripture will change people's lives forever by bringing them closer to Christ. That's all they did. They didn't, they didn't pick it. In fact, they put their missionaries on the sidewalk outside the, with the Book of Mormon. And, but that's, the, know what matters Turn those lemons into lemonade. There are ways to do it with your imagination and with your love for others. Right? If you truly embrace the most fundamental principle about our religions, it is that we love our God and we love his children. And if you keep those two priorities, I think the message of Mormonism is it gets better. And I hope you think, I hope you know you can count on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to be with you in that struggle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been an incredibly uh, rich uh, panel, and we're going to hear more now. So we're going to take some questions. Um, and uh, <clears throat> first, uh, I, as the moderator, I want to uh, exercise uh, my privilege and uh, ask um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sanders, um, what is the um, it, at what point would you say that it started getting better for uh, African American Catholics uh, in interaction with the broader Catholic Church? And I've, and is it how how good is it, and how far how far is there to go? I believe that there are definitely um, advancements, um, but I think when you look at African Americans, people of African descent, blacks in the United States, um, being included in the larger culture has always been an issue. Yeah. Um, and so I will say that with the Catholic Church, um, I would argue that things began to be better when cap black Catholics um, realized self-determination. Mm -hmm. When the Afro, um, the Afro, um, Catholic Congress um, started agitating, when Daniel Rudd started agitating for inclusion in the church. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I hesitate because I think we're always on a journey. Yeah. Um, I will say that one of the things that the Catholic Church and um, its knowledge of blacks really became apparent or visible when the church went in to the black community with schools, to the right. black communities with schools. And so 
Some could argue that for the Catholic Church, things became better when it got to know the community. Yeah. Um, you could also say that the community also needed something from the Catholic Church. So in a number of areas, there weren't any public schools um, that were serving blacks or the, the, the public schools were segregated. And so the Catholic Church saw that as an inroad. Um, and so when we look at Catholic schools, black Catholic schools historically, mm -hmm. and my research looks at the South, so I, I know that there are black Catholic schools in the North, um, but I'm looking at the schools that were established after um, the 1866 Plenary Council. Mm -hmm. And so you see the synergy or you see the communities, it's a give and take. The church wants something from the community and the community also wants something. So I'm not trying to be evasive with yeah, the question. It's complicated. Um, because it is complicated, yeah. and we see a, a different movement of black Catholics in the North. Yeah. So in the South, you had mostly the traditional understanding of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. but as blacks are migrating out of the South and moving North, you begin to see a more, uh, some would say, charismatic, dynamic right. understanding. So I would say that when we look at black Catholicism, it's not, um, it, it's it's not one. It's it you know it's yeah. not myopic. Right, they're right. they're different. Okay, different avenues. Thank you. Um, now I um, I was really struck by something that Dr. Uh, Dr. Flake uh, said about how um, how the proper response to uh, to persecution, and I I was really struck by what you were saying about um, what what amounts to it sounds like a sort of uh, empathy and uh, forgiveness. Uh, and sort of magnanimity, uh, uh, a generosity of spirit, um, and not returning, um, not returning um, uh, persecution with a sort of uh, resentment or bitterness, uh, but rather returning um, uh, uh, love and uh, uh, and uh, love and brotherhood and sisterhood, and that actually resonates a lot with what you said, Amir, as well. Um, what I wanted to ask Amir was. Um, the example of Imam Warthi Muhammad um, was, uh, that's a similar example of, of magnanimity, of generosity, and of, um, of, uh, of, of not, let's say, um, adopting a victimhood mentality, a victimized mentality, because one can be victimized externally and one can be a victim internally as well. And uh, I have, since becoming Muslim in 1992 and getting to know the uh, Warthi Muhammad, uh, community of Imam Warthi Muhammad, I have seen, and may Allah have mercy on him, I have seen um, that as being a characteristic of the, of the community which uh, I'm, I'm just going to go there, um, is, is, is very different than the um, sort of bitter um, identity politics that we're seeing today, which unfortunately, f speaking as a Muslim, I see Muslims falling into. So how do you balance that um, what, needing to fight for your rights, stand for your rights, while at the same time not uh, falling into the trap of uh, sort of um, uh, uh, bitter uh, identity politics, which actually can, uh, in you know, if one takes a pessimistic view, it looks like it's almost tearing the country apart. So hold on, as the doctor said, hold on to your principle, the religious principle of goodness, good character. Um, Imam Wati Muhammad uh, showed us the example, and there's many that shows us the example. Um, it's your goodness. You know, surely man gets what he strives for. The human being, out of God says, out of darkness comes light. So something that looks bad, good will come out of. Yeah. Um, you see, with the African American experience, we was once enslaved, then we got our freedom. Um, they're still struggling now, but things get better with time. Uh, it's a, it's an ugly situation that it looks now, but yet. It, it, there's a rise of the human goodness. There's a rise, there's a feel, there's a need for us to come together as a human family, no matter what color we are. You know, our, our experience, if you heard the similarities, our persecution of the experience yeah, of the other. Really amazing. We're all the other. Yeah. Okay? So when, when we have to show humanity a better way, better example, and that is kindness and goodness. Yeah. Yeah, and okay, thank you. And uh, Dr. Sanders, I uh, as I mentioned, I had the 
uh, the I was blessed to have um, gone and visited the uh, the jail where um, Joseph Smith was killed, and um, it's it's really extraordinary. I even re read somewhere that uh, the name Utah was not what the people of Utah wanted to name it. Uh, they wanted to name it uh, Deseret, I think, and that that the United States Senate as a deliberate re it, it deliberately to spite. Uh, the, the Church of Latter-day Saints named it um, uh, Utah, but it's interesting as well from the other angle that Utah was named after the Native Americans of, of, of that state. So um, what I wanted to ask you was um, how do, uh, I mean, I, I don't know how to formulate this as a question as much as just as a comment that it's, it's, it's really um, stunning the history of the Mormon Church and how they, how they trans, how they they absorbed the persecution that they absorbed and arose to become what is really, I mean, it, you mentioned the anxiety uh, uh, in the culture about Mormons, but at the same time, there's also um, a great deal of uh, respect for the, for Mormons. I mean, almost everyone, uh, even the creators of South Park said, well, they, they, uh, uh, the, the Mormons uh, um, are such nice people, you know, and, and I, I watched, an, I'm going to admit, I watched an episode of South Park once. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, it's very good, as you might imagine. And there's a fascinating episode where they're Condemning and mocking, very uh, in a very cringy way, they're mocking Mormon belief, and yet they're showing the Mormon family as being way better uh, in terms of its behavior and its and its um, the family's uh, uh, neighborliness because they just arrived in South Park and their um, you know and their sort of internal uh, cohesion than other families uh, in 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 Colorado. So I thought that in this and the in South Park, the town of South Park. So I thought that was so interesting. Um, but uh, how what what message would you have? Uh, to Muslims who, and, and and you may not feel entirely comfortable doing this, but I'll will say this that I again I I feel that Muslims have tended to often take um, too combative of an approach, and um, and I, I think of an example of the and this is this is an unfortunate example involving some young hotheads um, who actually um, called for the death of the creators of South Park because they mocked um, the Islam and they made an image of uh, the Prophet Muhammad in a bear suit. Um, and these care the and and this person went to prison and I actually knew this guy he was from Virginia he was a young man um, but then you have the Mormon response which was uh, was this sort of uh, mature and dignified and loving uh, response and I th uh, how would you um, obviously that's an extreme example but how would you um, advise Muslims in in in, um, in 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 this era, especially so as not to fall into this uh, trap of um, of identity politics, uh, politics, and you know. You know, I, I wouldn't presume to do that. I, I'd yeah. want to say, um, yeah. first of all, everything looks better in the rearview mirror, mm -hmm. right? We're not under the pressure that you're under right now, and there are particular political. Um, developments, they're just ratcheting up that pressure. So um, this, it would be like telling uh, uh, my people in, in uh, what, 1844 when Joseph Smith is murdered while under the governor's protection, thank you very much, um, to, cal to calm down, which they did do actually. It was, it was pretty amazing. That night, everybody was afraid that this town or this county of Latter-day Saints were going to rise up in insurrection and destroy some of the local citizens, but they didn't. I, I, I can't fully explain it in secular terms. And I would also say the Latter-day Saints made their share of mistakes. Oh, and, and, but I won't belabor that, but I gave you incidents where they too lost control mm -hmm. when under the heat of the moment mm -hmm. of, of being violently, physically persecuted. Yeah. Right. right now, most of the persecution that Latter-day Saints experience is, as I said, on an emotional level and a general, um, well, you read about it, you know what I'm talking about. So, um, mm. But we're safe, physically we're safe, and you're not. So I wouldn't presume to tell you what to do, except from what little I know compared to others, uh, you have the resources for peace in your tradition. 
And it's up to you as leaders in this tradition, I suppose, mm. to speak that. And there was, a, there was a moment in LDS history where this happened. The nephew of Joseph Smith, speaking in the early 20th century, stood up in the general meeting of all the Latter-day Saints and said, there are people of this country who believe we are the off-scourings of the earth, meaning that stuff that's in the bottom of the pan, right? And that they think they're doing God a service to kill us. And then he said, God designs to change that. And he demanded that people forgive. And these were people who had been mobbed in Missouri. He was mm -hmm. looking, it was 40, 50 years later, but they remembered or were the children who were children there and it were children of the people had the experience. And I, I think if that is a principle of your religion, which I believe it is, then you have to wrestle with that principle of, of forgiveness and trust in these other high principles that God protects us in ways that matter most. Mm -hmm. I have no other comfort to give you except you are a people of faith, be faithful, and God is true to his word, and it gets better. Very beautiful, thank you so much. Uh, so we'll open it up to questions. Uh, yes, sir, we'll go left to right. I'll give you the microphone. Uh, the gentleman there. A uh, question for Dr. Sanders. Um, you know, I, I see a deep irony in uh, the racism that you were talking about in the Catholic Church in America previously. And the reason I see a deep irony here is that, um, you know, the Catholic Church theologically uh, emphasizes a, a universal mentality. The word Catholic means universal. Even if you compare Catholicism with other forms of Christianity, I mean, one thing that I see to be really beautiful in the Catholic Church, speaking as a Protestant Christian myself, is that um, the Catholic Church is strongly represented in much, many more tribal groups, many more nations, many more racial, ethnic groups, cultures than other forms of Christianity. And so, since you know this this universal mentality of like we're all united by love for Christ and by what Christ did for us and by the death and resurrection of Christ is such a central theme in Catholic theology and thinking, there just seems to me to be, to be such an irony to that racism in the Catholic Church. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that of like what is your perspective on that and. And how does that tension uh, inform your perspective as an African American Catholic? So, so my my answer to that is is, I believe a really simple one. Man does what man does. In in my faith, I believe that God gave us all free will. And so there's a doctrine, and then there are people doing what people do. Um, and that may be a little too simplistic, but um, faiths have doctrines of what people should do. And then people do what they want to do. So, you know, I understand the irony in it. Um, and so the way that I hold, and, and I will share that I am fifth generation black Catholic. And so part of what centers me is my family. Um, I still, when I go into a Catholic church, I have images of my grandmother with her veil. You know, I could see her sitting in front of me. Um, I have images of people, a, a very strong community. And so when you, you say the racism and the irony, uh, when I look at the churches in the South, the black Catholic churches that I grew up in, I had a community that looked like me. And so I was not exposed to that, to those stresses or to that irony until I went off to school and the black Catholic schools were closed. And that's part of um, the genesis of my research is understanding that there were schools by my communities uh, for people who look like me and then those schools were closed. And so that's when, you know, I began to see that racism. Um, I don't, does that address, but... Yeah. Right, okay. okay, I'm sorry if... But, but it's, you know, 
man does what man does. I mean, the doctrines are there, and I will just say, you know, there are doctrines. We have correspondence of Rome writing to the, the Catholic bishops in the United States because the church in the United States was initially a mission. And so the church is trying to root itself in the United States. And, you know, Rome, some of the popes are writing saying, you're not supposed to be um, involving yourselves with slavery. And you have the letters going back saying, but, you know, this is what we need to do to keep, you know, our plantations grow going or, you know, there were different rationales. So I see the correspondence coming back and forth. And the thing that helps me is understanding that the doctrines say what is supposed to happen. And so my, you know, I, I, I'm centered by understanding that there is a goal, but also understanding that man touches things and, and messes things up. Mm. Uh, can I add to that, if I may? We have, we have religions to make us better not because religions are perfect, right? So every church, every mosque, every, every religious organization of the world has its hypocrisies and its failures. And in this country, one of those failures is gonna be race across the board. There's just no way any American religion escaped the taint of slavery, my own included. So I, you know, that's a, that's a question you can ask, but I, I, I think it ignores the force of racial hatred in this country and the way it infected all religions. Oh. Okay, uh, there is another question, I think. Uh, yes, uh, Hassan. Okay. So I'm interested in your uh, message, uh, Mrs. Kathleen. You said that uh, we have to be visible as religious people, but it's not easy when you are going to the university. Like um, for me, for young people like me, so there are so many of my friends, uh, they grow up in like very religious family, but when they go to the university, they think being religious, being visible to be a religious person is not really cool. Like um, even most of my friends think that actually being religious is not, living your life fully so <laughs> 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 so it's not that easy especially like uh, if you are being religious they they will say like uh, you will be excluded sexually so um even like there is kind of like service so uh, when i was in the university there is kind of like pick up service to go to the church to go to the temple but they don't really use it like we have uh, they usually just go to the party like clubbing until um, morning, then just miss all the surfaces. So, it's like, how can, we, uh, what is your perspective on seeing this kind of like dynamics? Because like, it's not easy to encouraging the young people to become more religious and uh, as a the result, because it's not being cool anymore. So like people, if they are interested in religion, they only see from the YouTubes. And then like the dangerous thing or the dangerous part of it the message sometimes on YouTube or like on the online website is not really good messages. Like maybe you will be trapped in extremism or something like that. So how can you see this kind of like dynamics and like how we should address this kind of issue? Thank you. I'd really like to defer to the Muslim leaders in this room mm -hmm. to, to uh -huh. address that question on how to I would phrase it, how to support you in a secular society, at the very least, that, that's the beginning of your question, but also um, the, the um, well, how to support you in a secular society that also has enticements to violence. Um, particular kinds of freedom that, that lend themselves to violence against yourself and others. Any, yes, Amen. please. As the doctor stated, she said we have to be true to our faith, our traditions. There's many examples. In Islam, you had the Kaaba, the Hajj. We make tawf, 
You go counterclockwise. You go counter the government, counter the society, and follow the guidance of God. You have the example of the prophet and his kindness, his gentleness. There's people, they, there's, in my family, you know, I have non-religious members of my family. But you have to be a model and, and have patience and perseverance. As the doctor said, things get better with time. God has promised that, that things will get better with time. Be true to your faith. Be true to the kindness. Be true to goodness. Eventually, you went through. You have the example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was persecuted, stoned, bleeding. You see persecution through all the prophets. We're not prophets. So we know we're going to be persecuted a little bit more. In the Quran, it says, even to the point that his, Prophet Muhammad, his companion, they cried for God's help. Oh, God, help me. That's because of the persecution that they was being faced with. So patience, as it was stated. Quran teaches patience and perseverance, right? Let your goodness shine as the sun shines. As Allah says in the Quran, out of darkness comes light. As, as out of that, the dawn, you see the light shine. So out of community. There you go. And get a community around you. There you go. Mm -hmm. We're social creatures, right? That's what Hajj is all about. Social creatures. And you look at Hajj, you still, you know, they talk about racism. The well of Zamzam was founded by what? Hagar, an African, and a woman. But you can't tell us that today. We have to come more true to our words, true to our book, true, true to our guidance. Others will follow you. Others will follow you. We're not in a, 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 a Muslim or a religious community. We're in the hood. But because of our kindness and our goodness, you're protected. Patience and perseverance, surely man will win through. Just be true to you. And, and we'll hear a beautiful, I think, uh, some remarks on that from Imam Talib uh, over dinner, inshallah. Um, any other questions? Uh, yes, Alicia. Oh, yeah. Uh, my question is for Amir. I have never been to this museum before, and I'm familiar with um, early American history and learned more about the, the history of Muslims during the American Revolution. Um, but I'm also seeing these images of from the Civil Rights Movement, which you didn't touch upon in your opening remarks. And I didn't learn until grad school how much of a religious movement the Civil Rights Movement was, that when I learned about it in high school, it was just you know, straight history and protest, but learned more of the depth of the spirituality of it. But I don't know, I know more about um, Dr. King's leadership as a Christian, but I don't know much about uh, any Muslim, uh, Muslims acting on their faith through the civil rights movement. So is there any history about that that you could talk about? Yes. Elijah, uh, uh, Malcolm, W.D. Muhammad, and most of the people that we see was taught by Elijah Muhammad. Uh, and Elijah said that uh, Islam was freedom, justice, and equality. Period. For all. Freedom, justice, and equality. That's what we fought for. And we fought for human rights. Amongst the, 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 the civil rights era, Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad, we talked about the human rights was more important than our civil rights. Respect us as human beings. And this is what we push for and we promote it more of and because of Malcolm Dr. Martin Luther King was more successful they said we'd rather go with this one than with that <laughs> one okay so uh, uh, it's good, good. there's dualism we got two eyes one vision two ears one hear hearing two hands we have to function as one God made us as dualism you know life is dualistic and so you have to take the good with the bad, and this will evolve us and grow. But yes, Muslims are engaged and involved in the civil rights and the human rights and the human dignity, even to today. And this museum has uh, fascinating examples of that from the, the, with the Islamic movement and the Islamic Party of America and all kinds of dif different interesting phenomena that were going on during the civil rights area that are very little known. So um, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Um, my question is for all the uh, leaders of the, the different faith, different religion, all three of you actually. It was great. Um, I heard about the, uh, the persecution um, m during the uh, times of the slavery and the, uh, also a couple hundred years ago and the uh, 1866, I think uh, you mentioned. I have a question for 
most current unprecedented persecution because of a group of people's faith, ethnicity, and race. I belong to Uyghur minority in China. There are about three million people are being in the modern day uh, concentration camps with a modern day slavery. How do we get attention of the world? How do we get attention of our ummah? How do we get attention of other faith groups to make a difference? Thank you. I, I think you have, <laughs> I hate it when that happens. <laughs> oh, we uh, love it. Now we can eat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't eat yet, but that, that was fast. We got a few more minutes. <laughs> um, I think you have attention. I don't know what to do. When I, I think of the state of international affairs and I think of the lack of United States leadership in the international community, I, I, I think of neoliberalism and the way money drives everything, just everything anymore. Um, uh, and, and I think of previous circumstances. I think of the Jews in the 1930s in Germany. What did it take? And even today there are people who deny. Uh, so for me, this this question is one of suffering that I, I do not have the answer to at all. And I'd be more interested in hearing from you ab about that experience and what you think we could do. Well, we, yeah, what we can do is uh, um, after, uh, when we're during dinner, um, then maybe there'll be an opportunity, inshallah, for you to say something. Um, but yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah. I'd like to take the opportunity to talk about the issues. Vietnam especially, um, there is tremendous uh, religious repression and serious problem on climate justice. And the world doesn't know about that. They only mm -hmm. see Vietnam as a, a beautiful place to go and visit and have honeymoon there. And when they see churches and pagoda full of worshippers, they think that's religious freedom. But in reality, it is not. I mean, there are special police everywhere. They control every movement. Do you have to get permission to hold any kind of meeting at any levels? Uh, a priest, before he is ordered, must get approval from the local authorities. And they would want to take your property for whatever reason, they just grab it. And still, you know, Vietnam is considered as an American ally. And as you know, we need to emphasize that human rights is a basic tenet of our foreign policy. It should be that way. Instead, it has been put on the back burner because trade goes first. And we, we have to work very hard to make things happen, like she said. Uh, China has serious issues, uh, and, and Vietnam too. Vietnam kind of duplicates the system in China. I mean, the churches and the temples are shadowed by government officials, mm. and they decimate the moral tenets of those uh, institutions. So how can we have better democracy in those communist countries or totalitarian countries without agents of change. In Vietnam, if you put on the application, your religious information, they don't accept you at senior level position or at political infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Because they, you have to put down you are atheist in order oh. to get through. Well, that's a central tenet of communism, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I would like to take up to introduce uh, Reverend um, Jin, he was a political prisoner for a long time. He, um, it was a miracle he survived of all the beating up and he finally came here. Um, mm. He would love to have your support 
and uh, whatever question you want to have, please talk to him. Yeah. But we are very comforting in having this community. Um, and I know I even in our own country here, we have issues. Mm. Even though the world <laughs> perceives America as a beacon of freedom and justice. And I could, my sister, I could relate to what you went through. Thank, thank you so much for that, yeah. Um, so we, we are blessed to have this really beautifully diverse group of people here. Um, I, the people who are watching uh, on the live stream can't see it, but it's a, it's, <laughs> it's really a sight to behold, and uh, it reminds me of what uh, Amir said, uh, the verse from the Quran, that God created us into different nations and tribes so that we would get to know one another. Um, and so thank God for that diversity. Um, so this is uh, what we're going to do. Uh, since it's uh, Ramadan, it's Iftar, the, the Muslims here um, will be able to eat um, in, in a moment, so there are dates and uh, water on the tables, and we have coffee, I believe, right? We have coffee? We, so we it's do. Very it's in the hallway. Yeah, very important thing. We have coffee. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, Muslim or non-Muslim, you're welcome to uh, partake of the dates and the water, and then we have um, a buffet uh, here of um, kebab and, and different things, of course. So, um, the, the Muslims, uh, anyone who wants to pray, we're going to pray, and Imam Talib will uh, lead us in the prayer, inshallah, and everyone else can go ahead and uh, go and um, line up and start getting your food. Um, we'll pray and, the, and then we'll we'll join you uh, after we're done praying. And then uh, during dinner, uh, the, towards the end, we'll hear from Imam Talib, who will uh, address us on the resilience of um, minority uh, religious minorities in America. Thank you so much, and thank you to our panelists. You were really amazing. Thank you. You're welcome to please continue eating. Um, continue eating, but what we're going to do is we're going to have about five minutes. Uh, we're going to have a representative of the um, Uyghur community here in uh, America uh, to speak about the um, uh, oppression of the Uyghur uh, community in China. And uh, we'll hear from her for about five minutes, and I'll ask her to introduce herself because I don't have her name uh, or her organization. And then after that, we'll hear from Imam Talib uh, Rashid of Masjid Muhammad, who will, uh, who will speak to us. Um, so please go ahead. And feel free to continue eating um, uh, while, sh while, while our speakers uh, speak. Assalamu alaikum. This phrase is banned right now for the Uyghur Muslims. Cannot say Salam Alaikum anymore. My name is Rushan Abbas. I am from a Uyghur minority in northwest part of China. I'm a founder and the director of campaign for Uyghurs. 11 million Muslims on Chinese census. According to Uyghur census, it's about 20 million because Chinese government always tried to show our numbers less so they can call just a minority. Being persecuted today, facing unprecedented atrocity in the modern 21st century in this information world. George Orwellian wrote 1984, during the 1940s. And 1984 is 35 years behind us. Yet, the communist Chinese government developed a surveillance police state with high-tech facial recognition softwares, ubiquitous cameras in every corner, GPS tracking devices on every vehicle, QR scanning codes in the homes so they can monitor who's in it, who's coming in, who's going out. 1.1 million Chinese cadres moved into Uyghur homes to live with. Imagine uninvited 1.1 Han Chinese people, they are not Muslims. They just come in and they eat with you on your table. They sleep on your beds. These are the people who's living in the everyday lives like you and I, just normal lives supposed to be. On top of that, we have three million Uyghurs are in modern concentration camps, taken away from families, 
according to witnesses who came out of the jail, came out of the concentration camps, they are describing the camps being forced food and the sleep deprivations, forced indoctrinations, mental and the physical abuses, torture, taking, forcefully taking unknown medications. There are crematorias being built next to those concentration camps for the culture doesn't believe in the cremation. We are Muslims, we don't cremate bodies just to leave no evidence behind. All I'm saying, these are not just words. Every one of them are backed with news accounts. If you search everything I said on Google today, you will find news reports, evidence. As Mrs. Flake, I think, did I get your name right? mentioned earlier, you're supposed to speak and practice your constitutional rights in this country as freedom of speech or do something about it. And I followed that. Being an American citizen, I followed my constitutional rights in this great country by speaking about this atrocity. I talked about the conditions of the camps and the faith of my in-laws on September 5th, 2018 at the Hudson Institute, one of the think tanks here in Washington. Six days later, as a retaliation, my sister and my aunt were taken, abducted by the Chinese Communist police. They are 1,400 kilometers away from each other my sister lives in Urumqi, capital city, and my aunt was in a small town 1,400 kilometers away from Urumqi. They both were taken at the same day to send me a clear message for me being a vocal about this. Later, I heard from distant relatives that my aunt is being released, but it has been eight months. I have no idea if my sister is still alive. Ambassador Tsui, the Chinese ambassador to the United States, he talked about this when he answered the media. It's reported on newspaper, you can look this up too. Said that we are turning the Uyghur people in normal persons in those camps. Basically, our ethnicity, our religion, our culture made us abnormal people. So they are putting us to those concentration camps to get rid of all that. The evil prevails when the good men do nothing. The world is not doing anything. We are confronting a muted world. Muslim countries, the other Democratically, financially, I mean, uh, strong countries, what we call. Yes, there are a lot of talks, a lot of sympathy, but no action. What you can do to help? There are two things that could happen now. One is, there is a Global Magnitsky Act. It's in place. It's a law that's targeted sanction against the, the human rights abusers. We could push this. We could sanction some of the Chinese officials who are responsible for this atrocity. Yet the Commerce Department is blocking it because of the trade negotiations. Other countries are also, because of the Chinese market, Chinese money, nobody is doing anything. European Parliament passed resolution, but no action. Basically, the Uyghur Muslims are becoming human collateral in between Chinese Communist government's hunger for power and the other countries' trade deals and the economy. 
The reason for this is our homeland is Turkestan, which is called Xinjiang province, lies in the strategic heart of Xi Jinping's signature project for his world domination, Belt and Road. It's a gateway to Central Asia. It's gateway to Europe and Africa. So as the Holocaust's final solution, the Chinese government decided to just eradicate our people. The second thing what you can do is there is a Human Rights Policy Act in place right now introduced by, uh, I mean, um, resolution, the bill, introduced by uh, Senator Menendez and the Senator Robio. We only have 30 signatures from the Senate side, 58 signatures from the Congress. We still need more than 160 congressmen's signatures on that, and the 20 senators. So please, please, I beg you on the behalf of millions of Uyghur Muslims, write to your representatives, ask them to sign Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. Thank you so much for this time that you've given me. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's do exactly what she said and, uh, and try to do what little we can um, in our capacity to help uh, that situation. Um, so now we're going to hear from Imam Talib uh, Rashid, who's going to speak with us about the resiliency of uh, religious minorities in America. He is the Imam of the historic uh, Masjid Muhammad, America's mosque uh, here in DC, one of the most important mosques in the United States. Uh, it's a great blessing uh, uh, for him to address us today. So let's hear from Imam Talib. Thank you. Rahim, and that is, with Almighty God's name, the merciful, uh, the compassionate, or we can say the merciful twice. Uh, it is indeed an honor uh, to be here, and we certainly want to thank uh, the Religious Freedom Institute. Uh, this is an important event, as we are hearing, and uh, we're just glad to hear that it's being echoed. Other things like this are taking place. Uh, things take time. Uh, I will say one thing. <coughs> I will say one thing in uh, Arabic, and I won't say any more Arabic because of, for the sake of time. Uh, but Almighty God says, "Yeah, you had nasu, ataku rabbakum, aladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida." God takes us. Uh, he's speaking to humanity, and uh, really. Uh, Nas, uh, yeah, and Nas uh, is speaking to humans who are really in touch with their sensitivities, their natural human sensitivities. And he said, have a high regard. He didn't use the word Allah. He said, have a high respect, a high regard for your Lord. But that's Rab, your Lord, God and Evolver, cherisher and sustainer. The one who brought you from nothing to something takes you along the course and stays with you through all that you endure to your destiny. He said, have a high regard for your Lord who created you. Min nefsin wahida. Now, min nefsin wahida, that takes us back to a common identity, uh, to a common origin. And we know that what we call the heavenly faiths Christians, Muslims, Jews, the others, we all go back to a first. Uh, we know there are six days when we speak about creation. And although we know a day to Almighty God is not the same for us, but we know we're given six days for our reality. And he said he created such and such on the first day, and it was good. Second day was good. And again, it's consistent with the Torah, the NGO, the Gospel, over the New Testament and the Quran. This, these six days, are, they're consistent. On the sixth day, what's consistent is uh, we call him Adam, and the heavenly face uh, call him Adam. I call them, it says in scripture, and we name them Adam, meaning there's both, too. We know we have Eve, we have a Howard, different names, but it says, and we name them Adam. So Adam is a type. Adam, uh, when Adam uh, was created on the sixth day, the same thing was said about Adam that was said about everything else 
that was before Adam that Adam came out of. And that is uh, that Adam wasn't created with a racial identity, wasn't created with an ethnic identity, wasn't created with a national identity. So we are to focus on what was that first identity. And this is the most important thing for all of us to get us to respond to each other. That first identity. That first identity that was given to the first one by one who created him is the most important identity and is the identity that's strong enough to move us and is strong enough to uphold every other identity that came after it, and that is human. There's only one human type. There are no two types of human. So when anyone is experiencing around the world, they're the same as us. If we focus on human, we are to connect with that life. What we find people often do is focus on the labels that come after human. And that's not my label, so it's not as an immediate concern as it is if you had my same label. That's why Almighty God wants us to focus on the first life. In fact, Muslims, every, we just prayed. Uh, that prayer teaches us, and some Muslims, they get past, they, they're not thinking about the information. It's the ritual, and that contains the knowledge. Uh, but it teaches us we are facing what's called the Qibla. Qibla uh, coming from the word Kabbalah. Uh, we're in the Ramadan now, and, and, and we come into Ramadan. I'll give you one more expression just so you can hear the sound here. God says, Ya ayyaladina amanu, kutuba alaykum musiyamu. Kama kutba ala ladina min kabalikum. Kabalikum. Min kabalikum. So you hear that word kibla in there? Kibla, kabala in there? Uh, he's saying that says fasting is prescribed for you, it's a prescription for you as it was for those who came before you, Christians, Jews, and others. Min kabalikum be before you, those who came before you. Kabala, meaning those who come before you. So every five times a day minimum, we have to face this house that Adam laid the foundation and Abraham built. Two fathers in our history. Adam laid the foundation, Abraham, and we say peace be upon both of them, he raised the house with his son. And we have to face that because what came before is that common identity. And from Adam came all of now what we have these wonderful, beautiful, diverse expressions all from the human family, the human family of Adam. And now we're here today They've, they've come from Adam and we have spread out. And Almighty God gives us in another uh, 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 verse, he again reminds us about our nature, our common nature, how he created us and that we all come from a male and a female. So everybody here, there's no one that's all male. There's no one that's all female. In us is immediately a male and a female, our mother and father. And then because you, you got their mother and father, this, so no one. So he said, so he's talking to all of us. And he said he made us different, gave us differences, some translated tribes and nations, etc. And this gives the formula and then he lets us know what the issue is. He said he made us different so that the differences will make us curious. So we begin to approach each other and learn and exchange and build up and get to know each other. But in the word that he used, the word is lita arafu, lita arafu, to get to, and that word lita arafu means that you first have to know yourself. Because in knowing yourself, now when you get to know other people, you have something that you know about yourself that you can exchange and share with others. And then he says that of those, the one who gets the honor, the one that's honored by him is the one that does the best deeds, who does the most good deeds, who seeks to be close to him. Not Because he knows that we're gonna look at race, we're gonna look at ethnicity, we're gonna look at nationality, and these things that come after that. So he said, those things don't give you the honor with me. The honor comes from what you do with the life that I've given you. We are here now in America in 2019. And actually this is in world history right now. This is the 400th anniversary. And it's good we're in this room right here, in this building right here. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm proud to be here because I, I've been the leader now for about going on uh, nine years. Uh, when I came, this wasn't here. And this is one of the first things that we had uh, to establish. It, it was this, this right here. Uh, we've been here five decades, but this hasn't. But it's been here for about five years now. How many? Oh, it's been so about the same. It's that same time. So, and uh, the history that's here. 
And I know some feel that as you look at the building. And then now we'll talk about just the 400 years from when they take it. We know they have other dates, but this is a date that's agreed upon, the 1619 date. Uh, this, 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 this process, this, this, this enslavement process uh, happened in America. And they said that the, the type of slavery that took place in America, shadow slavery, it was, it, it, there was other, but the type that took place here was the worst type in the history of the human race, of the human race. But yet there was an endurance. There was an endurance that has taken place. And uh, we're all here now in 2019. There are going to be a lot of things happening in August uh, of, of this year to, to, to remind Americans about what happened 400 years ago, where we are today, and other things that are taking place as we're speaking over the, over the course of this year, since this is the 400th anniversary of, of, that, of that event. But when we, when we look at it, uh, Almighty God wants us also to look at the struggle. There was a struggle for humanity that has taken place. Our dear brother Amir, our curator here, mentioned a figure in Islamic history named Bilal. Uh, he was, we, we speak about what took place in America being the worst form of shadow slavery. In that history, he was the one that suffered the worst treatment, the worst torture. He kind of gave a picture of that and then he couldn't speak anymore and he put, it, put the finger up and you see the finger on here and that's one of the symbols uh, now he mentioned that he didn't know if he was going to come out of that or not he didn't know if he was going to be freed but 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 before he had already resigned internally and was free and he let he let those who had captured him know you can do what you want to do with the body but you don't have me I'm free for God that was way before they started really the torturing. And they, and they said, okay, well, we're going to see. And they took him through the test. And he didn't know if he was going to die or not. But something happened. The consciousness was raised of a dear companion of our prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the presence peace upon him. And he offered a significant amount of money, way beyond the value of a slave at that time, way beyond the value. And then Bilal was now free. His whole life was free, not just the soul, the spirit. His whole life was free. There are some similar things that happened. God says in the Quran that, that uh, I was just hesitate. I want to, I want to do the Arabic because it'll take up some time. But he says, do you calculate, do you think, those who believe, those who have faith, and we're speaking about people of faith. We had faith, those who are connected with faith who are speaking to us today. And we elect, we, we've been listening to what they have endured. So Almighty God says, do you think, do you calculate? The word really means that you really calculate that you're going to be left alone and have the peace and serenity and everything without the faith that you say you have being tested and put to trial. And then he reminds those, he said, look at the past, even those that we heard about some prophets that were tested here we, in, on the, from our panel and what they had to go through. He said there were prophets and those that were with them that they cried out. And they said, when will come the help of Almighty God? And Almighty God put the answer there in the book. He says that his help is near. Now, therein, therein is the challenge because we never know when near is going to be. We never know when on time is going to be. But the key is that we have to stay the course. We stay the course. Everything is temporary. We're here now where we are now with this diversity that we have that we didn't have before. I just, I just returned from Denmark. Uh, State Department sent me there. Uh, they're having issues. Uh, if, you, if you don't know Denmark, uh, their constitution actually says that all religions subjugate to Christianity. And that's what their constitution says. Christianity, you know, ours doesn't do that, but theirs does. And of course, that's challenges. That offers challenges for the other religions that are there, and they become very diverse 
over time. So we were meeting. We meet. We met with about six or seven of the different big lead, biggest leaders there, and they wanted to know what how do we what do we do in America? How can we overcome now? And of course, we spoke about the history and the kind of things we were doing. And of course, they would say, "Well, that's because of your constitution." And I had to remind them of this. It doesn't matter whether they have a constitution like ours or not because they did acknowledge God in the constitution that there will be an opening. There will be an opening. Because the, the, the common, our common, just in concepts, those are the things we list, the, 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 the line, like this line on the floor, it's just in the concept. But all the common good of our faiths is the same in terms of how to treat people and everything else. That that's an opening. They just have to continue to endure and look for it. There will be an opening to have them relax enough to welcome those that have migrated. And, ha and they're actually citizens now. They are citizens and they don't want to go anywhere else. They love the land. It's a very good land, very beautiful land. They're doing a, some very beautiful things there. They have 100% uh, uh, education. All universities are free, even for the, those who have migrated. Health care, universal health care, all this, it's beautiful. Uh, more than 50% of the population, in fact, there are more bikes than people. I mean, you got bikes everywhere. I was just so amazed at how many bikes uh, you see. Uh, so when we look at where we are today, and then God wants us to, he tells us in the Quran, he takes us back to the sale. The cell, the sperm cell, I guess I can say that. He takes us back to that and lets us see where we were to where we are now. To say that we had, we, 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 among, we started out, uh, it's something that is seemingly impossible. There were millions upon millions of cells trying to get to the destiny. And those who are here now, and those who have been here, the billions who have come and gone, the billions who are here, the seven billion now, and those that have come, they're the ones that they endured and they overcame those odds, those odds that was against the life if we're here. So Almighty God reminds us of that. And uh, we may have some doctors here. Uh, they did a report one time, and I get ready to close on this note. Uh, they did a test on, the, on, on uh, stress when the body is beginning to form and the flesh and everything is beginning to come into place on the stress that's there. They said if, if, a, if a person were to register that, after, consciously register what's happened in the womb, it's like you are being torn apart, just pulled You're right now, just taken apart. You're feeling that, con no sedation or anything. But the, mem the memory of that, the memory of that, is wiped out but the ability the capacity to overcome pain pressure us is clocked in to the nest that was what I quoted he said we are all created from nefs and why he died one soul just as though there's one human there's one human type no two types of humans there are no two types of human souls every human soul has that ability to overcome and to endure all types of hardships and difficulty. They just need to do what we did in the beginning at that sale is to stay the course. We can't stop, we can't sit down, we have to stay the course and the help will come. History shows us over time and it's on time when it comes, it's not on our time but it's always gonna be on time because God said he's always there and he's always close. He's never absent, he's never out of the equation, never out of the picture. He's there. And he said, everything is temporary except him. Everything is temporary except him. So in time, if we stay the course, we'll get enough activity, we'll get enough of that conscious mind that, that, that like what free Bilal. And he represents the life of a whole people. And we had the same thing that happened here in America where there was some conscious activated and then that became, we had the emancipation piece came. We got remnants of stuff now that we're seeing in this society right here, but nothing like what was in the past. Things have changed. Things don't stay the same. So we give you that. Uh, that's been in the doing. We, Muhammad Ali on this wall right here. He went up against the whole government. Something that was he had resigned. 
that he would, may have to go ahead and go to jail. Because he, he, this, this seemed to be impossible. No one else had been able to do that. But what he didn't do was stop. He didn't just resign and give in. He stayed the course. And he was blessed with a unanimous vote by the Supreme Court to let him go free. And we know he became, in fact, of surveys say he was the most popular known name in the world. And they said in, in, in the USA Today, for the athlete of the century, in the year 2000, they had him on the front cover. And they were interviewing people about him. And many of them cared nothing about the boxing. Those that were not of his race were saying they were teaching their children about him because he stood for something. And that's what our dear sister is calling us to do, to take stands and, and to be the people that Almighty God has created us to be. We're stand, standing now. This is a spiritual feat. If I didn't have my spirit, didn't have my soul, I couldn't stand. It's a spiritual feat to be the people he created to take stands. If I didn't have it, I wouldn't be here. We are supposed to take stand. And he says, I'll say this not in one Arabic. Kunu kawamina bil kiss. Be a people. To be the people that I created you to be. Stand for something meaningful. What can be more meaningful than that that degradates, goes against our very humanity? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Imam Talib. So uh, I'm going to uh, close the uh, evening, um, and we'll. Uh, I just want to say um, uh, thank you uh, so much to each and every one of you who came, and to our speakers and panelists. Thank you, uh, and I want to encourage uh, people who are watching um, live or who watch this later uh, to support the American uh, America's Islamic Heritage Museum. We'll make sure to put a link on our uh, website for this event page, um, and uh, 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 may Allah bless you. I just want to say that. Uh, the devil wants us, uh, wants to tear human beings apart and wants us to fight. And um, what we've heard tonight is um, that it doesn't have to be that way and we can follow our angelic natures. So um, let's, uh, let's keep doing that. Good night. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you.